Hello, friends, and welcome back. All right. We're starting to get caught up. So it's June, but uh, yes, this is the March thought paper on Melchizedek, the root of Levi. Okay, ready? Here we go. The often applied excuse is that originally the Canaanites learned the truth about the true Elohim. And according to that so-called scholar from Southern who stated in a video that the Ugarit tablets reveal a devolution from the knowledge of the true Elohim into polytheistic beliefs with regard to the forces of nature and Baal worship in general, as is noted here. There's the link. Setting the scholars' views aside, what will now be discussed is the Bible's treatise of Melchizedek and who is actually revealed. We all know that the Lamb, Revelation, is the root of David and the line of Judah from Revelation 5. But Melchizedek, as presented by Paul in Hebrews chapter 7, 1 to 3, would have to be the root of Levi. When Paul mentions the Levitical order, he is speaking of a tangible presence of men that existed as representatives of an eternally transcendent priesthood, yet they as men were weak and mortal. An office can only be represented by the men who serve in that particular office, and the same has to be said about Melchizedek. Melchizedek would have to be an eternally transcendent individual and not a metaphor or microcosm of something greater. Would not the superior also have to be a tangible transcendent individual since he was superior to Abraham who carried Levi within his loins? Please see this link. It's in the thought paper in the description box below, the very first link. Fact is, if the Canaanites were led by a king of righteousness, okay, in the pre Davidic stronghold of Jebus, they would have also learned about that righteousness from the present king who came out to meet Abraham after his victory? It would have been a great victory for the Canaanites since we are assuming that Melchizedek was their king of righteousness and that there would always be peace between the Canaanites who were the people of Melchizedek and the people of Abraham. since the advocates of the theory believe that he was the king of Jebus or Jerusalem. And don't get it wrong, he was, but in what way? This detail also presents a major problem, since synonymously speaking, this would make him the king of the Canaanites as well. Yet why are the blessings and the emblems of the future ministration of the order of Melchizedek in relation to a non-Canaanite?
God set him apart and called him out of his land to follow him. Something doesn't add up when a Canaanite king blesses someone outside of his nation, especially when God placed a curse on the Canaanites. And now you have a king of the Canaanites running a whole city, and he lives in an isolated capsule since his people do not follow the path of righteousness that he, he does. And he even goes further and blesses a foreigner as second to himself. How could you possibly serve a king who was greater than Abraham and not follow his example of righteousness for the whole of the Canaanite world? By the time of Abraham, God had already given the order for Abraham to be separate from the Canaanites. Which means that something is not adding up. Right? Fact is that the whole affair, in reference to Abraham's victory over the five kings that captured Lot, was clearly of supernatural intervention, as was the appearance of Melchizedek, whose interaction with his own people would have historical records. Fact is that the eternal righteousness of Melchizedek would have been a very advanced truth for that time, as is the very advanced insights of Revelation 13, 8, and eternal righteousness by faith of the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, which is eternal righteousness by faith today. And the fact is that most of the so-called scholars have not been able to perceive the matter, the eternal righteousness of Melchizedek, since they insist on presenting a human element in representation of a transcendent being. And this falls far short, just as the, just as the Levitical order fell short, on account of the fact of men who served in an office that was weak on account of their, their mortality as priests. Reread Hebrews 5 and 7. So the same can be stated about Melchizedek. The best explanation up to date is that of Dead Sea Scroll 11Q13 and 11Q Melk 2 which presents Melchizedek as part of Elohim. And this clearly falls into line with John 1.1, 1, 1, as well as what is stated by Paul in Hebrews 7, 1 to 3. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 and 15. Melchizedek's kingdom, just as Jesus taught, was not of this world. And that city of Jebus, prior to the Davidic era, was not his kingdom in the literal sense, but in the spiritual sense. So it would have to be a Christophany. And the proof is found in the emblems of the kingdom itself. And also the blessings conferred upon Abraham had nothing to do with the blessings upon the Canaanite people who were cursed during the time of Noah. Also, the emblems of bread and wine relate to the future ceremonial law, and in particular, the Feast of Passover, which was critical in relation to the understanding of Melchizedek qualifying for the future priesthood. by way of eventually laying aside his eternal righteousness and paying the penalty for sinners, from Isaiah 53. And also, qualifying as stated in Hebrews 5, 
by firm adherence to the Father and later retaking that former glory in the form of the order of Melchizedek as the designated Son of God. As revealed in Romans 1.4 and Hebrews 6.20 and Hebrews 7.1-3. Meaning that as a human, partaking of the slave form, he overcame sin in the flesh and now retakes his former glory of Melchizedek and applies it to the combination of the divine spirit and human genetics, which in the Greek language, is referred to as the monogenes theos, or uniquely begotten God, which to all intents and purposes is another way of saying the order of Melchizedek. Fact is that in Old Testament times, the archangel Michael was considered the lawyer advocate of Israel. And Michael and Melchizedek are clearly intertwined in Hebraic theology, theological traditions, as seen in the Michael and Melchizedek scrolls of the Dead Sea. An ideal text which locks in the matter of the difference between Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek is in the revelation that is seen in Zechariah 3. Since the angel of the Lord, without mentioning the word priest, in reference to himself, is representing the role of Melchizedek by giving the following instructions. The main question to ask is the following. Is the angel of the Lord acting out the role of Melchizedek? The answer would be, Yes, on account of the fact that he is removing Joshua's filthy garments, placing a turban on his head. Then ask yourself the question, was the angel of the Lord the pre-incarnate Christ? The answer is yes, since Paul stated it in 1 Corinthians 10. One to five. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The next question is the following. Does Jesus Christ, as great high priest, do the same thing that the angel of the Lord did for Joshua? The answer is an emphatic yes the parable of the wedding garment. Also, in Revelation 19, Jesus has a name, and that name is the Word of God. So here we have it. An eternally transcendent being who fulfills the role of Melchizedek since he has eternal righteousness as the Word who was with God and was God. See Zechariah 3. The last portion reveals that the angel of the Lord, being the original Melchizedek, equals transcendent being, tells Joshua that he is bringing in his servant the branch, Messiah, which would have to be of the order of Melchizedek, since Psalms 110, 1-4 is basically presenting the same information. And Revelation 5 is also presenting the same information as well. Since the single stone 
equals verse 9, which is Christ, has seven facets. This can emphatically be stated as being the seven spirits of God. Which are depicted in Revelation 5. The most interesting statement reveals the transference from Melchizedek to the order of Melchizedek, where the angel of the Lord clearly states that he is sending forth his servant. The branch, the Messiah. The angel of the Lord can only be speaking about himself in the future as coming in the flesh of slave form as depicted in Philippians 2, 5 to 10. Summing up Melchizedek doctrine, to sum up the teaching, Melchizedek is the Alpha of which Jesus stated about himself in Revelation 22, 13 to 16. Which equals the root of Levi and the order of Melchizedek is the Omega or offspring of David, which retakes his form of glory, which prior to the incarnation was purely God, but now in the form of the order of Melchizedek it is the divine human combination which overcame in the flesh of, hu of man and retakes his former glory in the form of Melchizedek, made like unto the Son of God. This biblical concept is vastly different from the Neoplatonist teaching of the Eternal Son which has been accepted by pretty much the whole of Christendom. There you have it. That's how Melchizedek is the root of Levi. I hope that clears up the matter for you. There will be more. Until next time. God bless.